And I think you're really lucky because of the moderator. Uh, three years ago, uh, this young man won our Pluto Comics contest. He is extraordinarily funny. He's a, an Emmy Award winning writer, which I am not. He is a uh, stand-up and he's incredibly articulate and very smart, will help lead this. Please welcome Adam Yenser. All right, thank you, thank you guys. Who's excited to see Ben Shapiro here today? Nice. Like he, uh, like he mentioned, I am an Emmy Award winning writer, but they're daytime Emmys, which is like, I'm a better joke writer than the ladies of The View. <laughs> I, I, I'm currently a writer for the uh, Ellen DeGeneres show, and I'll, uh, I'll keep writing for Ellen until they find out I opened for Ben Shapiro. <laughs> Then I'll be, uh, then I'll be kicked out of Hollywood forever. <laughs> no, but um, this is gonna be a great event. This is gonna be a uh, town hall style. So when uh, Ben comes up here, he'll let you know when. There's two microphones in the middle aisle here. Um, you can line up at the microphones, wait your turn to ask a question, and um, you know you'll have the chance to talk to Ben, but keep the questions concise and to the point. There's a lot of people here. We want to hear him speak. We want to get as many people in as possible. Um, I've been a fan of Ben Shapiro as one of the few conservative working comic writers in Hollywood. Uh, I've loved Ben Shapiro as, ever since I. Uh, yeah, there's, there are not many of us, but we're out there. Uh, no, I've been a fan of Ben Shapiro ever since I first started reading his articles on Breitbart several years ago. Um, he has some great books out there, Porn Generation, Bullies, you should check out his books. Um, really, really important cultural books you should check out. Uh, I honestly don't think there's very few people who articulate conservative values from a more intelligent and rational and well-informed position than Ben Shapiro. And, uh, I, I'm such a big fan of his, I'm almost ready to click on the part of the podcast that you have to pay more to listen to. <laughs> but no, we should all listen to Ben Shapiro more often. You guys are going to get that chance right now. Uh, he is the editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire. You guys know him from The Ben Shapiro Show. Please give it up for Ben Shapiro, everybody. So welcome to my living room. Uh, <laughs> love you right back. All right, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, everybody should know that we are moving the book signing because we started late here. We're moving the book signing to after the debate. Uh, and as soon as this is over, get right back in line for the debate because they're basically back to back now. So <laughs> just be aware of that. And, uh, and I have no opening statement, so I'm happy to take as many questions as you want to give. So charge in line. Uh, I have, there it is right there. I do have uh, one rule, which is my usual, uh, which is that if you disagree with me, or if you are on the left particularly, raise your hand and you get to go to the front. No cheating. I'm, we're doing the honor rule here. So, Wow, someone's being murdered in the other room. Okay, so <laughs> go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll sing show tunes in the meantime. You can ask the question, I'll repeat it. So I do think that the president, if he has the authority, should uh, prevent the Congress from getting out of Obamacare. They should have to live with the regime that they've created for everybody else. Um, you know, as far as whether they have, uh, whether he has the constitutional authority to do it, I, to, to, be, to be fair, I haven't actually looked in detail at the legislation, the section of the legislation, so I'll have to punt on that one. Oh, hi, Ben. I'm a fan, um, but I'm not going to throw you softball. You said at a college campus event, uh, quote, something I hate the most from the right is this constant refrain, yeah, socialism is a great idea if only it worked. It's not true. It's an unbelievably morally crappy idea. My question refers to an example. Um, in the early days of the Mormon church, they practiced what is known as the, as the law of consecration, where church members uh, consented to have material goods redistributed. Like most social experiments, it failed because of individual weakness. Uh, in theory, is this morally corrupt? So here's my view of economic systems as a general matter. Uh, there's a difference between how you handle your family and how you handle the broad economy. So in my own family, we are socialists, meaning that my wife and I share a bank account. 
right? It means that my children can rely on me to take care of them. That's a socialist system in the sense that we all pool our common resources and then, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, but that's my family. It doesn't work when you're talking about a broad range of people with a vast difference in priorities. And what you see very often in religion, and this is true uh, with regard to, for example, the, the Old Testament talks about why it doesn't like interest payments. Okay, that's in the context specifically of, you know, basically a familial Jewish tribe. Uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the New Testament, when it talks about how all of the disciples shared everything they had in common, it's specifically talking about a group of people who are treating each other as family. That doesn't extend out to an entire society. Every time it's tried as an entire society, it ends up destroying the society because you can't get everyone to consent to a common set of goals that would require me to do more work on your behalf. I don't love you enough for me to give you my stuff. You don't love me enough to give, you my, to, to give me your stuff, nor should we have to. So, okay. thank you. Hi. Howdy. Okay, so I was wondering, what's your opinion on uh, our president, Donald Trump, delaying the movement of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? I mean, he, he promised that he was going to make the move. He hasn't made the move. I mean, it's that simple to me. I, I don't see any re reason, rhyme, why he shouldn't move the embassy. Uh, I know there was a theory that was going around that maybe Prime Minister Netanyahu didn't want him to move the embassy. I've seen no evidence to that effect. In fact, I've been told by people in the know that Prime Minister Netanyahu said precisely the opposite, that he would very much prefer if President Trump would move the embassy. Uh, the Congress has, for you know, more than a decade, been pushing the, the executive branch to move the embassy. Uh, there's really no excuse for it. Uh, and I understand that he says it's a delay and eventually he'll do it, but it seems to me the timing should not be material, especially given what's happening right now. You know, proof that if you were to attempt to internationalize Jerusalem in any way, it would immediately fall into discrimination, violence, and brutality. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Howdy. Um, I'm doing research currently on whether or not a uh, flat tax is better or marginal tax rate for income taxes. So I would like to hear from you for why we should have a flat tax slash regressive tax or the argument for that. Okay, so, so I have a basic moral argument against the progressive tax rate, which is that just because I am making more money does not mean that you should be able to take more of a percentage of my money. Uh, percentage is by nature... A percentage is by nature fair. I mean, 20% of my money is more than 20% of your money unless you're making an enormous sum of money. Uh, you know, so, the, so the fact that uh, you know, there are people who think that you ought to pay more money just as the more money you make, it, it, there, there's no real moral argument for that other than I want your money and you make a lot of it. Uh, so I have, a, I have a problem with that just on a moral level. On an economic level, it seems to me that as you penalize people for making more and more money, there are going to be gaps, right? And you see this. You see that there are certain income cliffs where people are afraid that if they make more than a certain amount of money, that the next dollar they make is now going to be taxed at a higher tax rate. And so why would you bother hiring 20 new employees to get you past that mark if you're then going to have to pay a higher tax rate? It doesn't – it's not a steep – cliff, depending on how large the marginal tax rate increase is. But if you have what you used to have in the United States, like a 91 percent tax rate for people who are making like five million bucks a year, once you get up to that point, what's the point of making another dollar? You may as well just save your breath, not hire the employee, and, and keep your money. Okay, thank you. I think it was my setup, man. I have a tax question as well. Um, oh, you guys are just excitement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't start with a five-minute speech. Um, what is your, your uh, opinion or, or your position on taxation of religious institutions? Uh, so, taxation is – so I, I have sort of a split opinion on this. Or tax-free. You know. Right, right, ta tax exemptions for religious institutions. So I have, I have kind of a split opinion on this a little bit. So my, I'm of one mind which says that there shouldn't be tax exemptions for virtually anything, that, that the government should basically just tax everything that it's going to tax, and that way we're all running under the same rubric. By the same token, I also do believe what it says in McCullough versus Maryland, which is the power to tax is the power to destroy. And once you give the government the power to tax specific institutions, then you could see them use that in order to destroy those institutions. Uh, with that said, I tend to err more on the side of the first than the second. In fact, I think one of the worst things that's happened to religious institutions in the United States is you've seen a lot of religious institutions get out of the political business because they're afraid they're going to lose their tax-exempt status. And that, to me, is actually an abdication of religious duty in some cases. Right? There are religious values that undergird politics for millions and millions of people in the country. I think that's an actually good thing. Uh, and the fact that religious institutions won't do it anymore because they're afraid that they're going to lose their tax-exempt status and then people won't give them enough money, you know, maybe if you get rid of that incentive, suddenly you actually see – maybe you suddenly see religious institutions start to get more active in terms of forming a social fabric and getting involved in politics, which I think would actually be a good thing. Hey, Ben. 
Uh, I was just in the previous uh, panel and listening to the infighting among Republicans, and it was quite frankly depressing. And coming here is actually inspiring, seeing uh, you know how many people came for you. But I'm just wondering, what ideas do you have that you know for us to stop the infighting, to get together and not look at each other as enemies? So I think that we have to number one stop attributing nasty motives to one another. I think that there's an attempt by people on both sides to attribute nasty, and when I say both sides, I mean really both sides of the Trump question, because that seems to be the big divide dividing conservatives right now. On the one hand, you'll have people who are like me, who didn't vote for other candidates, and some people who are like that will say that Trump voters, that are, they have bad intent, and that they were just, they, they, were, they bought into everything that was bad about the man, and they sort of malign Trump voters as though they did something deeply wrong. I never said that. I don't believe that. I think most Trump voters voted for Trump, not because they loved all the bad things about Trump, but because they thought that Hillary Clinton was the worst candidate in the history of the republic. So, yeah. And on the other side, I think that Trump voters would be wise to look at some people who are very uncomfortable with Trump and say, maybe there's a reason people are uncomfortable with Trump, and maybe we'd be better off instead of embracing all of his stupidities, instead of saying that he's playing 987 degree, underwater, upside down, hungry, hungry hippos, right? Maybe instead of doing that, maybe we ought to just say, listen, some of the dumb stuff he's doing is dumb. Some of the good stuff he's doing is good. Like, it's, it's, it's so weird to me that we're even having a debate at this point, right? The election already happened. He's the president. When he does something that's good for conservatives, we should all cheer. When he did Gorsuch, I put on a MAGA hat. Okay, and when, and when he does something stupid, like he attacks his own attorney general on Twitter for a week and a half, and then activates Anthony Scaramucci, who's, le, who's, legi, who's legitimately, at this point I'm just rooting for entertainment, so I want Mooch to stay, but, is it, but he activates Anthony Scaramucci, who legitimately is the Ellis character from Die Hard, right? <laughs> and he activates him to attack the, the chief of staff, instead of just having the balls to fire his chief of staff. You know, I think we should all agree this is kind of dumb. Like, this is not useful. The question shouldn't be, is it entertaining? The question should be, does it forward the ball? And I think that people on the Trump side need to get away from the idea that there's some sort of mastermind genius working inside Trump's gourd that is making all of the dumb things obviously super smart, because dumb things are dumb. I mean, come on. All right, so uh, bear with me, Shapiro. Um, I had this all written on my phone, but my phone died on the way here, and... Uh... I left my charger in the car, and I'm wearing a bullet belt, which takes maybe five minutes to take off. So I'm not running, the, not running through the metal detector again. Um, so I don't really stand with either party. I was raised Republican, but um, I side with you on a lot of things. I, I'm called an anarchist centrist. Um, it's a weird label, but, uh, right? It's a weird, yeah. <laughs> I can't think of a better one. Apparently, no one else can. Maybe mutualism, but okay. So my question is. Uh, and this isn't an attack, and maybe this is indirect. I could go over this for hours, but this is the best way I can yeah. say it. Um, do you think either party will push in the next four years to decrease income equality and return power, opportunity, decent wages, and liberty of the working people of this great country and truly push to fight against the great favor and power and liberty and opportunity that is so very much in the lap of the super-rich industrial elite or will both parties continue to serve the elite as they have for many decades? Okay, so my first problem is I fell asleep halfway through the question. Um, <laughs> but Like I said, I don't know how else to it's, word this. But it's, I don't know how else to I mean, word it, this. It, um, I spent 20 minutes trying to figure this out with my buddy, and he's like, I don't know how else to word this. It took you 20 minutes to say it, too. Yeah. So, that, so, <laughs> so, that, so uh, here, here's my feeling. Number one, I don't care about income inequality. I care about the idea that there are people who have actual obstacles to success. That's not the same thing. Right, if you have somebody, you know, I've been in the 1%, I've been outside the 1%, I hope that all of you one day are in the 1%. The fact that I am now in the 1% is nothing from you, right? I didn't take any money from any of you guys, right. and I would challenge you to, you know, take me to the cops if you think I stole something from you, because I certainly haven't. Uh, so the idea that that is a chief problem in the United States, I just don't agree with. But if the idea, if the question is, does either party have a real incentive to help the American people, the answer is no. Both parties have an incentive to engage in, in the rage machine. I wrote an, an entire piece about this for National Review. Right now, uh, what you have is an angry moment. Everybody is pissed about something. But the question is whether your anger is justified. Right? If you're a good person and you're married and you're getting angry about something and you want to have a good marriage, the first thing you should ask is not what did my spouse do to me. The first thing you should ask is, is it justified that I'm angry? Like, I'm, am I really doing the right thing here? And in politics, the same thing is true. Political parties don't have an incentive to do that. So say, for example, you're living in a dying mis Midwestern town where all of the jobs have moved 
overseas because of competition or because of technology, you're no longer going to get that job at the factory. Like, it's just gone. It's not coming back. So you can be pissed at something, right? So the Democrats say what you should be pissed at is you should be pissed at all the people on Wall Street who obviously screwed you, and that's why you don't have a job in this industry where a machine's doing your job. And on the right, you have a bunch of people who will say, well, it's China, right, or it's Mexico. And, <laughs> and let's be real about this. The fact is that a lot of those jobs are gone because te technology moves forward. I mean, you don't have the same economy that my parents had where my mom worked at a company for 20 years. And since I got out of law school, I've probably worked five or six jobs. And that's not unusual. People are moving more and more often now. But no one's willing to say that. Because if you say to somebody, your anger is not justified, the best thing that you can do right now is recognize that no one cares enough about you to get in your way. You know, go out and make something of yourself, and we'll try and find resources for you, you know, on a, on a social level, not a governmental level. We'll try and go out there and raise the money so you can go to college. We'll try to raise the money for you so you can, we'll try to give you the job opportunity so you can get your start. But that's the best way to get ahead, not to sit and bitch and moan about politics. Those politicians, unfortunately, those politicians lose. That's what they do. Right? I'm not in the business of getting votes. And so I can say all these things. But if you're a politician and you say to your own constituency, you're pissed, but your reason for being pissed is really bad, how about get your shit together? Right? Then... If I can add one more thing, what is the solution if half the labor jobs are maybe gone to robots in the next 20 years? If you well, I mean, so, so I think that if we reach the point where we have the replicator from Star Trek and all goods are, you know, plentiful <laughs> across the board uh, and there is no more poverty, essentially, because everything, the cost of things becomes zero, then you can start talking about a universal basic income. But until then, scarcity is what drives the economy. There has not been a magic shift in jobs. We still have you know, as close to full employment as you can have if you trust the, the, U, the U6 unemployment statistics. Oh, yeah. uh, and so the idea that we are on the verge of, you know, half the country being unemployed and everybody's going to be wandering the streets selling oxy, uh, it's, happening, it's, it's happening in some places in the United States, but the, the idea is that there have always been these labor shifts. Right. Well, I'm not implying that's going to happen soon. I'm no, no, I understand. And, and I understand there are a lot of people asking that question that are not just you. Right. But I think that we should probably focus on the problems that are now and five years and ten years in front of us right. as opposed to the future when technology becomes so grand that I don't even have a job. There's somebody up here, you know, speaking in, in computer language right. to you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you for your time, sir. Hi, Ben. Howdy. Can you hear me? Um, I don't know where all the leftists are. They didn't come to the front. Um, but I used to be a leftist. Um, you converted me about a year, year well, thank ago. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> really? Wow. Wow. OK. Um, it's like an AA meeting. I, <laughs> I didn't expect that. I didn't have a speech prepared. Um, but I, I'm, a, I'm also a, a gay Jewish Republican mm -hmm. from New York, of all places. <laughs> now, that's weird. Um, and uh, both single-handedly you and my dad helped, uh, you know, convince me with uh, really just um, intellectual honesty to consider the other side. So I hope you keep doing that. That's well, a perspective for, that's thank very you for valuable. thank you actually considering it. You're the one who has yeah. to do the work, you know. Um, so I've heard you say many times that the marketplace works out issues of discrimination by letting perpetrators lose business from fair-minded folks, thus eliminating the need for government overreach. But I've also heard you say that while not illegal, it's nasty to exact revenge on businesses with boycotts. So what are you left with? Yeah, so this is actually a really good question. So I think that uh, the, the question is, does it impact the operation of the business? Meaning that, so for example, Brendan Eich at Mozilla Firefox is somebody who gave money to the anti-gay marriage effort in California. And he was basically thrown out of his job by the higher ups there. And I thought that was nasty because that actually creates a climate where political viewpoints that you disagree with are a way of throwing you out of your job. Uh, if, however, you have a situation where people are, you know, the, the, the actual function of their job is being impacted. So Brendan Eich's job was not impacted by his actual viewpoint. Then I don't think that a boycott, it, 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 if it impacts the function of your job, then a boycott might be appropriate if you disagree with the behavior. Right? If, if it doesn't actually impact the working of your job, I don't think a boycott is appropriate. So, so workplace, right, workplace so, discrimination. Exactly. So Brendan Eich, I mean, another example that's controversial here in L.A., like, if, if you can't show me any, any evidence that Donald Sterling was, bla was banning black people from his games, I think that boycotting the Clippers because of Donald Sterling is really weird. Like, Donald Sterling is a piece of crap, for sure, but if it didn't impact how he was actually running his organization, there might have been impact on that, by the way, but if there wasn't, then it's weird to boycott him. So my general rule on this is that a boycott is appropriate if you feel that the, the business is being run in such a way as to be discriminatory, but a boycott is not appropriate based on the viewpoint of the person who owns the business if it is not enacted in the actual practice of the business. Um, and a distinction, um, mm -hmm. discrimination uh, based on protected class. Uh, well, I mean, listen, it's a free country, so, you know, my, my moral view may not be your moral view. Like, things I may boycott may not be things that you boycott. 
Uh, I don't think so. That, that's I don't, I don't believe in general uh, protected class stuff. Gen tends to me to to apply to governmental action, not to private citizens. Right? Okay. Like for example, there's parts of the Civil Rights Act that talk specifically about what private businesses can and cannot do. I think that's an overreach by the federal government. I think the federal government should be in the business of what the government can do. Jim Crow was a governmental policy. Right? Jim, to, to pretend that the government was not complicit in Jim Crow, the government was Jim Crow. And as soon as Jim Crow was done away with, those Jim Crow laws were done away with, the South is now highly integrated. Gallup polls show that people in the South have uh, almost, ex I think, precisely the same levels of racism as people in other parts of the country. Uh, so the market does work, in other words. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Mr. Shapiro. I'm a huge fan of your podcast. Um, one of the most common arguments that the left has against capitalism today is that the, wealth, uh, the wealthy and powerful are in bed with the government and acquire power from the government through campaign donations. One of the most common arguments from the right against big government is that, also, big donors have a strong influence on the government, and so policy is catered towards spe uh, special interest groups. Seeing as both sides agree money in politics is dangerous, why continue to allow private donation to political campaigns? So I don't think that money in politics is dangerous. I think money in the government's pocket is dangerous. Meaning that I think that if I want to give money to a political candidate, then that's fine. Why was, it that, why was it that for the vast majority of American history, money in politics wasn't a massive danger? And the answer is that it wasn't a massive danger because no one cared what Washington, D.C. did. It wasn't involved in your business. It didn't regulate you, right? It was actually unconstitutional for it to do so. Uh, and as government grew, as the coffers grew bigger, as it had the power to crowd out your competitors through regulation, then people see a necessity for spending a lot of money. So this was Trump's example, right? When Trump was saying this all during the primaries. And during the general, he kept saying over and over things like, well, you know, I was involved in giving money to politicians in a corrupt way because that's the way the game is played. Well, that's the way the game is played because there's actually like a giant piggy bank of money uh, at the federal government level. I don't think that banning money in politics changes any of that. You'll just see different forms of people attempting to, to gather these people in their pocket, right? I mean, you can't stop. How do you stop a corporation, for example, uh, or a union from telling its members that they should go out and vote a certain way? Forget about political donations directly to candidates. How do you, how do you actually stop that? I mean, that's, a, that's, that's an actual violation of free speech. Right? I have viewpoints on politics. Those viewpoints on politics, it's my, I, I have the freedom to express those viewpoints on politics. There is, there is no gap, in other words, between political spending on candidates and campaigns and me going out and pushing, you know, going out and printing my own yard signs or the New York Times printing a story. This is all part of the grand tradition of, of politics and back and forth in the country. What needs to happen, if you actually want to stop money in politics, is stop letting the government be so damn big. The bigger it is, the more people care about grabbing pieces of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. I'm a very big fan. I actually have a book. I hope, hope I get it signed. Um, but my question today is, uh, Given that if you examine all sides of the media spectrum, I'm a very big fan of your show, by the way. We watched almost all of it. Oh, thank you. Um, if you. If you do, like, psychoanalysis, if you do nonverbal and verbal analysis of both sides, if you look at um, uh, body language, if you, if you look at historical context of everything that they're doing, and you expose the left, you expose the right, you expose the center, why do all of them say they don't have it, but they do, and it's been proven by everybody, and they just blatantly throw it out, like... What is it? Sorry, they don't um, have... Just hypocrisy or, or an extreme bias. Well, my, why, why is everybody biased? I mean, I think... No, that... no, no, like, why, why is it that when it's shown and it's proven by hundreds yeah. of people, it's just, they just can't deal with it? Well, I, I think that for a lot of people who are in the so-called mainstream media, people who consider themselves objective journalists at CNN, if you're brought up in a culture of, of, of the media where you are told that that's your job, then you tend to get into a mindset where you think you're doing your job. I mean, we all think we do our jobs on a daily basis. If somebody told you your job is to be objective about the, the matter that's directly in front of you, it's very difficult to live with a cognitive dissonance that says, I am politically of one side, but I'm going to put that to the side in order for me to pursue this objective analysis of the issue in front of me. Uh, and I think that if you go to J school, right, if you go to, which is where a lot of the people from CNN and the New York Times come from, and you're told that your political point of view is irrelevant to your reporting, but the, all the people who surround you think the way you do. You've never actually seen anybody. It's like a strange breed at the zoo. You've never actually seen another political point of view. You don't even know that you're biased when you are. So I'm going to attribute a lot of this to ignorance, not malevolence. And we on the right have a tendency to say, you know you're biased, but you won't say you're biased. And that's true for some people, like George Stephanopoulos, right? He's on the Clinton campaign. Obviously, he's biased. But for people, you know, like Maggie Haberman at the New York Times, maybe she's biased to the left because she hangs out in lefty circles, and it never occurs to her that she's infusing her stories with bias. 
So I, I, you know, I tend to try and avoid, if I can, attributing nasty intent to people with whom I disagree, because I think everybody's trying to do their best, or at least most people are trying to do their best, uh, and they just come up short. Okay. Uh, one, one last thing. If you had, say, 10 years in the future or whenever, would you run for president? <laughs> Well, I mean, 10 years from now, I'm fairly certain it's going to be Ivanka versus Michelle. <laughs> so I may be crowded out of the primaries. Um, but uh, I would never say never to anything. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Shafiro, I'm a big fan. Um, so just now that you're off the air, I want to know, how do you really feel about Mac Weldon underwear? Um, They're fantastic. No. <laughs> They're on my ass right now. Anyway. Um, Anyway, so, uh, so despite the fact that the cost of college has obviously increased due to all these government loan practices, um, it seems like the left continues to advocate for more generous and more and more subsidies, more loans. Um, that being the case, how should we decrease the cost of college without preventing lower income students from being able to attend? So the only way to decrease the cost of college is to stop with all the subsidies for bullshit majors. Right. Uh, so the, that would actually decrease the cost because what increases cost is obvious, I mean, supply and demand. The more demand there is, it's the same amount of supply, so they just increase the price mm -hmm. and just keeps going up and up and up. You keep subsidizing college, a lot of people are going to go, the cost goes up. Uh, so if you actually want to decrease the, the price of college, what you're actually going to have to do is you're going to have to say no more government subsidies for lesbian arts majors. Right? And no, no, more, uh, no more subsidies. Like, I, I, I'm sure art history is wonderful, but there are three jobs in that actual industry. <laughs> uh, and maybe you might want to try a STEM. Right? Or if you're going to be a lawyer, I mean, the, the entire educational system in the United States is really screwed up. Uh, if, the, the truth is that I did four years at UCLA in political science, complete waste of time. Right? I, could have gone, I could have gone straight to law school and apprenticed with a law firm and done it that way. That's the way we actually used to do these things. And that's the way they do these in other countries, right? There are other countries that do this where they, they say pick a track when you're 18 right. and now you're on that track and you go and you intern and you actually work in this job. People are not prepared for a If you think you come out of college prepared for a job in modern American economy, it's complete nonsense. What prepares you for a job, as everyone who's ever held a job knows, is actually doing a job. And so what we have to do, there's still areas that are, that are there's still, I mean, there's still trade schools where you're learning something. There's still areas of college that are useful. My wife's a doctor. She had to go through, through a biology major and then through med school in order to get that. You wouldn't want her coming straight out of college and operating on you. But, it's, but uh, I think that this is a very simple supply and demand issue. And by the way, the idea that, that poor people uh, would not be able to get a, a loan to go major in a STEM major if they have great grades and good SAT scores, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, there are plenty of right. banks who'd be willing, that's a good bet. It's a good bet by a bank. And what we've had right now is a lot of basically subprime loans to bad college borrowers, and then there's not even any security. You can't repossess an education degree. Right. So that being said, uh, I just graduated from high school, and I'm, for financial reasons, I'm heading to community college next year. Mm -hmm. Are you looking for interns? So. so. So California has a, uh, California has pretty strict laws on internships. We're trying to set up an internship program right now. If we do, I promise, I will put that out there on Twitter. Remind me that you're the guy who asked me the question of Politicon right. about it. You'll go to the top of the pile. Thank you so much. Uh, he disagrees? Okay. Uh, Sorry. I feel bad for people skipping lines. Is it, is it snappy? Is it quick? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for letting me cut in front. Uh, I disagree with you. I wouldn't say I'm hostile. Uh, for someone who speaks a lot about morality, it seems like you don't, uh, it seems like you avoid acknowledging Ayn Rand, and I'm wondering, would you agree to debate someone like Yaron Brook or any objectivist? I'd love to talk to Yaron Brook, sure. Okay. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I think that Ayn Rand's take on what drives capitalism is correct. Her take on uh, applying that to human nature and interrelationships between human beings, I think, is more of a problem. I think the debate should be ethical, but thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks, dude. Mr. Ben Shapiro, the Shabbat savage. The Torah <laughs> tank, the Hebrew hammer. <laughs> Very excited to meet you, sir. Um, I just wanted to start off with a couple of things before I ask my question, just because I have the chance in the mic. Um, number one, I barely recognize you without sunglasses, a joint in your mouth, and a Snoop Dogg song playing in the back room. <laughs> Shout out to Thug Life, whoever you are. And sec second of all, um, I can't wait to watch you contribute to the extinction of the water buffalo in about an hour. So. <laughs> I know you're going to have no comment on that. You're a classy guy, but I had to put that out there. All right. My real question is, though, it's pretty serious. Um, 
As a Jew, um, I've seen a lot of anti-Semitism recently in the past year or two. I mean, I expect it on the left. It takes the form of anti-Zionism, anti-Israel. They embrace people like Linda Sarsour, Keith Ellison, as you know, one of the head members of the DNC. Um, but what I've seen a growing trend, very disturbing, is uh, on the fringe, fringe right, you know, the alt-right, we've all heard you've been attacked by them. Um, I've seen some very just flat out, you know, anti-Semitic, just crazy, the Jewish question, mm -hmm. Jews run media, Jews are behind it, literally everything. And, you know, growing up, my parents were conservative and we were, you know, Jewish conservatives never, we were always, you know, out of the uh, orthodoxy, you know, most yeah. Jews are liberal. So, you know, I always thought the right was very welcoming towards Jews and welcoming towards Israel. And I still think they are, but why do you think there's such an increase um, uh, to towards Jews, both on the left and the right. Okay, so first of all, on the Chang thing, I'm looking forward to having a productive discussion with him when this happens. Uh, so let's put that there. Uh, as far as the, uh, as far as the uh, alt-right anti-Semitism, I mean, as somebody who received an inordinate amount of hate from the alt-right in the last year, uh, the Anti-Defamation League named me the number one recipient of anti-Semitic tweets for journalists on the internet last year. Uh, and that was largely driven by uh, the, the alt-right. Um, I think that people need to understand what the alt-right actually is and people who think they're alt-right. So not everybody who likes memes is an alt-right person. Okay, I think a lot of these, I think a lot of memes are hilarious. Uh, you know, I, I'm particularly fond of the Harambe memes. So I'm, there, there are a lot of these things that I think are really funny. Uh, but I think that the alt-right did a, a good marketing thing when they broadened their appeal. Because the actual basis of the alt-right movement, people like Jared Taylor and Richard Spencer, is, is essentially a, a white supremacist argument uh, that, the, that the white race created Western civilization and that outsiders to that race are threats to Western civilization. Uh, and I think that the rise of, of that movement uh, is partially driven a, as a reaction to the intersectionality theory of the left. So on the left, you've seen the, the, this, this attempt to basically paint everybody in the United States as a member of a particular race or sex or sexual orientation. They're not individuals, they're groups. And all of these groups have been victimized by Western civilization, and therefore they have to stand up and fight back against Western civilization. And there's a group of people on the so-called alt-right who aren't particularly conservative, by the way. They're not in favor of smaller government, many of them. Right. Many of them are overtly anti-Christian, not just anti-Judaic. Uh, and they come along and they say, okay, well, if intersectionality is good for the left, why can't it be good for the right? Right, why can't we have, uh, why can't this be true for white people? Right, if there's an interest group for black people, why not have an interest group for white people? And I think that that's, uh, the, the, that reactionary tendency gained some steam during the last election cycle. And, uh, and because they consider themselves to be politically incorrect more than just wrong, uh, yeah. they, they glom onto a person they consider to be politically incorrect, which is President Trump. Okay. And they used him as sort of an avatar. And I think that some of that's unfair. So um, that's why I think you saw the rise of this. Do I think it's more than a small movement? No. I think it's a very small movement. I think that when people suggest that it's taking over the Republican Party, I think that's nonsense. I think that there was an attempt by the alt-right to broaden itself out and pretend it was something that it wasn't. It was just people who were disaffected with the establishment. Okay, then I'd right. be alt-right. I think the establishment sucks. Right, I was a Tea Partier, yeah. but that's not what the alt-right is. And those are the people who are really driving a lot of that on the right. All right. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate Thanks. it. Uh, hi, Ben. This is a boring one. Um, so you referenced the book Nudge by Cass Sunstein at some point on the uh, podcast, and I'm uh, uh, very interested in the book. And um, I'm just curious of one, your, what your thoughts on the concept of libertarian paternalism are. Uh, are, because it yeah. sounds sort of oxymoronic, but I thought it was pretty interesting. It, it is an interesting book. So Cass Sunstein's book, Nudge, uh, was used by the Obama administration as sort of a handbook in terms of if you change the, for people who have never read the book, the basic idea is this. If you change the sort of presets in life, people don't tend to, people are not active, people are passive, and an object at rest remains at rest. So there's a sort of human inertia. So if you go into a cafeteria and all the choices are hamburgers and pizza, people will eat hamburgers and pizza. But if you take the hamburgers and pizza out and you put a regular and mango, people will eat a regular and mango. Because now there's an actual burden to them to have to switch over to hamburgers and pizza. That's the idea of the libertarian paternalism, basically. That if you, for organ donation, right? Instead of you having to opt into organ donation, we'll just make the default on your card that you're gonna be an organ donor now, and then you have to physically opt out of being an organ donor. So my the problem with this general idea is that it assumes that your presets should be everyone's presets. Uh, I think that, you know, there, there's things that I thrill to in that. I think everyone does, right? Like, so I tend to be somebody who thinks that we need more organ donation. In fact, I'm such a libertarian, I think there should actually be organ markets in, in some cases. Um, but, uh, but the fact is, um, but, uh, but the fact is that there are a lot of people who don't believe that and they'd be shocked to learn because they don't read the paperwork that when a loved one dies, they're an organ donor. And that's upsetting them, it violates their religious precepts. So 
I think that the baseline should be non-interventionism, not setting the preset at what I want it to be, because I don't get to control you. I mean, I think that, that that's where libertarian paternalism comes into conflict, because uh, even the idea that they're going to set the presets is paternalistic in a non-libertarian fashion. All right. Thank you. Hey there, Ben. Uh, so I understand that you're an adequate opposer of socialism. Uh, my, my question to you, to you is about socialist ideas that have worked in the past, such as Social Security or Medicare. I understand Social Security, so social security is a mess right now, but it has helped millions of Americans in the past. So do you think that we should banish socialist ideas in general in the United States or limit it? To banish. Like um, and the reason I say that is because... Social, so what socialism basically does is it takes the resources of a given society and it freezes them there and then it redistributes them. It doesn't account for growth. It doesn't allow for innovation and, uh, and enlarging the pie. Socialism basically says, however much money is in the economy, it's unfair how it's distributed. Take it, redistribute it, that's the end of it. The problem is once you do that, you get rid of the incentive to innovate and to, and to build new things and create new services. So, of course, it's true that if you take... If, you, if there are five of us in a room and I have five dollars and nobody else has any money and I just give each person a dollar, then everybody in the room is better off except for me. That's true, but I now know have, I have no incentive to go out and make five more dollars because you're all just going to take the money. This is true of Social Security also. Social Security has actually created an enormous downside for society now. So in the short term, it's great, right? You take a bunch of money that doesn't belong to you, you give it to a bunch of old people, they're happy. It didn't cost you that much money because it's the baby boom and there are a lot of people who are young and there are not that many people who are old. Then the baby boomers get old and now we're all screwed, right? People who are our age are never going to see our social security money. It's gone. We're never seeing it again. Kiss it goodbye, right? So, it, 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 so one problem is that older people did not have an incentive to save. So the savings rate actually went down after social security because you may as well spend your money. Somebody else is going to pay for you when you're old. The second thing that happened is people stopped having kids as much. It actually had a, a market impact. Jonathan V. Lass at Weekly Standard is a very good book about this. Uh, there is a, it actually had a market impact on birth rates because one of the reasons to have a kid, not to be cynical about this, but it's true, is that historically, when you get old, who takes care of you? Your kids, right? I mean, that was the net cost. The net cost was that you were going to spend an enormous amount of money educating your children, bringing them up, keeping them safe, and then when you got old, you weren't going to have to worry about it because little Billy was going to take care of you. Now Social Security takes care of you, so do you even have to have kids? And that's what's created this enormous bulge in the old population in the United States and very little on the, in, on the young side of the population in the United States. Uh, and because, as a society, we tend to abdicate to government what government is willing to take over, it's also created this immoral notion that the government's going to take care of all the bold people so we don't have to worry about it as a society. Social fabric doesn't matter anymore. So this is why I'm not in favor of socialism, you know, and, and Social Security is a good example. I'm not in favor of it because it has... Just like every other socialist program, it has a set of discrete beneficiaries, but diffuse victims. And the diffuse victims are much more common than the discrete beneficiaries, and they grow over time. Okay. Thank you. Please kick Cenk's ass tonight, please. Hey, uh, I have two questions. One's political, the other one's much more important. Uh, in <laughs> In your opinion, what's the best course of action towards North Korea? And the second question, what is your prediction for the end of Game of Thrones Season 7? Okay. Oh. So. <laughs> I, too, am much more fascinated with the second question. Uh, and, uh, in fact, I am I'm very sad that I'll be signing books for you instead of watching it tonight. Uh, but it's... So... I love all of you, but Game of Thrones is on. Come on. Uh, so it's, uh, so uh, the, as to the first question with North Korea, I wish I had a simple answer for you. I don't think there is one. Just like every other problem that festers in American foreign policy, this is a problem 50 years in the making, uh, and it's not going to be solved overnight because they have 13,000 pieces of ordinance pointed at Seoul. Even if we were to try and take out the, the Kim regime, there's a good shot that if they thought they were going down, they'd start firing ordinance into Seoul, and there are you know, millions of people in Seoul. You could easily see hundreds of 200,000 people being killed by the, by the Kim regime as they go out in a final conflagration of glory. Uh, so the, the options become very limited. I think that what President Trump was actually threatening today is the right course of action. You actually do have to put some significant heavy economic pressure on China if you want them to oust the Kim regime. Um, I, by the way, I think that that is the best case for sanctions on China. I don't think that trade is a good reason for sanctions on China. I think that this is a good reason. Uh, the, the, the human rights reason is a much better reason for sanctions. So that seems to me the only uh, real method that is available to us other than a very risky operation. Now, again, maybe I'm wrong about that. I'm not sitting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So maybe we have some military options on the table that are really fantastic. I don't know. If we do, we should use them. 
Um, if we don't, then all that's available to us is the economic leverage that we have at our disposal. Uh, as far as Game of Thrones, so, now the good part. So, uh, <laughs> as far as what I think is going to happen at the end of Game of Thrones, so, I think, uh, my, so my business partner, Jeremy Boring, is fantastic at predicting these things, and he has a beautiful explanation of what's going to happen for the rest of the season. I don't want to spoil it for all the people who are watching, because I think he's right on in how it's going to go. I will just tell you what I think the end of the series is going to be. So I think the end of the series is going, I think, I think Danny's going to die. Uh, I don't think she's going to survive. <laughs> Uh, I think that I think John will survive, but I don't think he's going to be king. I think what's going to end up happening is he's going to devolve power to a council led by Tyrion. I think that's where this is going, which is going to be really disappointing because they've been fighting over the Iron Throne for eight seasons, and we've all gotten into our monarchist, you know, feel. And then they go to democracy. It's going to be like, God, have you seen democracy lately? <laughs> so, uh, but that's where I think that it's going to go. All right, thank you. Hi, Ben. My name is Vakas Khan, and uh, I'm a legal immigrant from Pakistan. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> Here and to the country. <laughs> thank, thank you for having me, but now I identify myself only as American. Well, thank you for that, too. <laughs> and uh, other than that, uh, I'm a conservative Republican and uh, Trump supporter, and people like you and uh, President Trump made me uh, switch sides, and I was an ex-Democrat, and now I'm a proud Republican. Yeah. Well, thank you. So, so I'm also a Muslim and uh, I'm very proud of my religion and I call myself as a reformed Muslim who uh, does not believe in any violent interpretation of the scripture. Uh, the problem uh, which I face right now is like being on the right, I see there's an immense atmosphere of distrust and then on the left there is immense uh, atmosphere of denial and delusion actually. So. So how can we, uh, uh, like reformed Muslims like me, who are out there, but they are, we are in the closets, we want to come out, yeah. we want to voice out, but whenever I tried to do that, especially in the last election, I was intimidated, harassed, and bullied by the liberal left, and I yeah. call them like liberal left fascists, who just came after yeah. any different uh, uh, opinion or voice of dissent. So how can us uh, reform Muslims, who want to live under American constitution, no other law, American constitution, can come together and bring the uh, two sides together and find some common ground and tell them like this is the reality and we are willing to live uh, peacefully with the rest of the Americans as they are our fellow uh, uh, countrymen and brothers and sisters. Yeah, so I mean... <laughs> so, we on the right have an active obligation to provide, to provide a loudspeaker for people like you. We have an obligation to provide a loudspeaker for people like you. Because the only, the only way that change is really going to take place in the Muslim world is if people like you are heard. Because one of the big problems is that, as you say, the, de the denialism on the left about the nature of radical Islam and the extent to which it has actually infiltrated some major institutions. You know, the one Council on American Islamic Relations comes to mind, so does ISNA. Uh, you know, these, these are major organizations that have a place with law enforcement. They're talking with the White House, both Republican and Democrat. There's denial that happens because these are the most prominent organizations in the country. And people who are reformists or moderates, you know, they're two separate groups, I understand, but they, but, you know, they both are, I think, fighting for the same end, which is a reform inside Islam that would, that would do away with violent interpretations of Islam and tamp them down uh, and, and push Islam into a reformation, the likes of which every major religion has gone through. Judaism went through it, Christianity went through it, and it's time for Islam to go through it too. We on the right have to make an active attempt to push people like you into positions where you can speak clearly. So to that end, my email address is bshapiro at dailywire.com. And please email me. I'm happy to print any op-ed by you. I want, I want everybody who is, who is pushing this agenda to have a louder voice. I want everybody who's pushing this agenda to be given a voice because on the right, we have a tendency to say, all Islam is garbage, we should, we, we, it's evil, it's, it's terrible, we have to crush it. My view of religion, as a religious person, right, as a person who sits here wearing a funny hat, you know, as a religious person, my view of, of holy documents is that they are open, obviously, to vast interpretation. There's a lot of violent stuff in the Old Testament as there is in the Quran, uh, and it is up to people who I think properly interpret their religion to take over the, the future of that religion and to promulgate it. So I'll do everything I can to help you, and I, th I hope everybody else in the right wing does the same. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Can you please tell me your email again? <laughs> B. Shapiro, first initial, last name, at dailywire.com. Thank you. Uh, for those of you that think I...
for those of you who think I cut in line, I did not. I'm over 50, and so we did. Uh, we don't cut in line, and we usually don't destroy property. That's not something we do. Uh, we respect other people's property. But listen, I'm surprised nobody said anything about health care. I'm glad you talk fast, and so do I. Now, here in the United States, you have to have uh, car insurance, okay? It is mandated by the government. I have a great plan. I pay $200 a month for three of us or three cars, and uh, I have a $500 deductible. My insurance is great. They take care of me. I also know people that pay $25 or $50 a month. They got a $1,000 deductible, okay? Uh, because there's so much competition, the millions of people have to pay, the premiums are very low. Um, with this new health care plan I'm seeing is why they can't do that. The problem that I see is that the government is trying to get in things they're not supposed to be involved in, okay? It was never mandated for them to be involved this month with insurance. President Obama did this. Medicare, for those you don't know, or for people like me, 65 or older, Medicare was meant for people that are disabled or um, poor, okay? They put all these healthy people on this plan, which they need to keep, keep their, keep kick their butts off right now, okay, and require them to pay insurance. Now, for some reason, if I get into an accident, whatever, and I have insurance, my insurance cover uh, company pays. For some reason, if they require you to have your insurance, they don't go after and penalize me or go to my taxes. What they do say, listen, uh, you didn't pay your $50, so now you got a $150,000 bill that you're going to pay for because you didn't do what you're supposed to do. So for this new Medicare plan, they got to make this real simple. I can get this done in a week. Okay. First of all, they need to block grant this money to the states and say what they, we're taking care of your Medicaid and Medicare payments that you have here for your patients, all the healthy people's getting off, pre existing conditions, uh, uh, stub, uh, toe is not a pre existing condition. We're to determine what that is, this your money you use. It is not the federal government's job to take care of your opioid uh, addictions, okay? That's your job as a state. You're not doing that in the inner cities, and I'm sick of these other cities coming in, and all of a sudden this drug abuse is a health problem when for black people it's a crime, okay? We're not going to have that anymore. So this your money, this all you're going to have, you do what you will with it, okay? From there, we're going to go on, um, and so people are going to get their own things and take care of it. From there, the government's going to get back to protecting the citizens. I remember you. And I you, you know who I am. I, lo I love your program, <laughs> uh, but if you if you would not read your 1,000-page oh. counter to Obamacare, <laughs> okay. that'd be appreciated. Just get, so, to, the, get to the question, Marcus. So my I, question I, I is, everything you're saying. what can we do as far as getting information to these senators that seem to have no backbone to let them know to get the government out of the health care, what they're doing, and to do just simple things, simplify it, and they can have this done in a week. So what does that process look like? I mean, or do I need to fly to Washington to get it done? <laughs> let me know. That's my question. So, I could handle yeah, my business like right. that if I need so, to. So the answer is you need to fly to Washington to get things okay. done. Um, the problem is not a lack of solutions on health care. The problem is a lack of incentives on health care for politicians. Because again, the incentive is always not to tell people what they need to hear. Uh, it's always to tell people what they want to hear. And what people want to hear is I'm going to make your health care free. I mean, listen, President Trump ran on the promise that he was basically going to cover everyone. Like, we all say that he ran on the promise of Obamacare repeal. That's true, but he also made the promise he was going to cover everybody's health insurance. He said everyone will be covered, right? And it'll be cheap, and it'll be the easiest thing in the world. You can't have all those things at once. That's not the way it works. So, uh, you know, I, I could give you my whole health care spiel, but I think that, uh, that the lady did a pretty good job of it, so. Uh, hi, Ben. First off, I want to thank you for everything you do. You really helped me uh, discover uh, different, poli uh, different politics outside of just the liberal left, <laughs> uh, forcing everyone to make, think a certain way. Um, this week you were in front of the Congress uh, discussing, uh, discussing people being canceled on when they want to speak out of campus. Um, do you really think that legislation is the way to go to help solve this problem? So, it's, so, okay, so before I start, I see a lot of people are leaving because they want to get in line for Chank. I totally understand. It's fine with me. Okay, the, the, the second thing. I still love you, though. I appreciate it, dude. And I love that beard. Okay, so, uh, the, so as, far as, the, um, as far as the legislation that's being pushed in, uh, in Wisconsin, for example, there has to be some sort of repercussion for administrators who refuse to abide by the law. We cannot have a situation where people break the laws in Berkeley or at University of Wisconsin or at Cal State LA, and the administrators do nothing, and then there's no, there's no repercussion, there's no ramification, there's no uh, remedy that, that is available to people like me. Uh, and so what that piece of legislation in Wisconsin is an attempt to do is it, it ties the administrator's hands. It basically says, 
if someone commits a crime, that person will be punished as any person would be punished in this circumstance. It's sort of like mandatory minimum sentencing uh, in law. So I don't see a huge problem with that. I would see a huge problem if they were actually restricting protests as opposed to interference with other people's free speech. Uh, may, I, uh, may I ask another question? Sure. Um, also, the, yesterday they did a cancer sub eh, censorship. As you can tell, I, could do, I do words good. Um, <laughs> they asked this question, and I think it, I would love to hear your response. Is the responsibility to stop uh, disruptive protesters or Antifa, is, does that re responsibility lie with the school or with the group who brought them in or with the police? It lies with the police. Okay. But the schools have very often been asking the police not to do anything. All right. Like, Thank this, you. Is, this has been a, a material problem. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, Ben. Hey, how's it going? Um, so you've spoken a lot about the unearned moral superiority of the left and its increasingly socialist policies in terms of economics specifically. Um, I would like to hear what is the, com the compassionate argument for more conservative policies in economics? So the compassionate argument, so two things. One is that empathy is actually bad politics. Uh, so empathy makes you a worse person in politics because you empathize with the person who's right in front of you, but you forget about the other hundred people the policy actually impacts. There's a very good book about, yeah, about this right now. Um, it, the, the compassionate answer is if you want a policy that values both freedom and efficacy, you cannot have redistribution that violates people's rights. I don't think that the leftist argument is a moral one. I think it's actually a deeply immoral and non-compassionate one. It's, the, the question for compassion is always compassionate to whom? Right? Compassionate to the person you're taking money from? Obviously not. It's compassionate to the person, to the person who, to whom you are giving money. But if you're undermining the entire principle of human sovereignty in the process, that's not compassionate to anyone, including the person who receives the money. That would basically be the argument. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi, Ben. Uh, so we only started getting into like paying attention to politics a lot more about uh, a little over a year or so ago. Well, it's been exciting times, man. Yeah, it's been fun. And uh, so but when I wasn't paying attention, I felt like I was more on the left. Like I felt like I identified with a lot more of what they were saying because it seemed like... It's nice and it has puppies and yeah. rainbows and, and unicorn parts. So parts. when I had those opinions, I felt like it was a lot easier to have conversations with people. Even if you, even if they felt you disagreed with them, they thought you were still on their like side. You're a nice person. When you're on the left, they assume you're a nice person. Okay, so I have a feeling this will come up. So I don't feel like any of my like beliefs changed, but by paying attention to you and like other ones, like Stephen Crowder, or listening mm -hmm. to other people who left the left, like Dave Rubin, mm -hmm. um, it like showed me that like. It's not about what your uh, ideas are half the time, it's just about what party you say you're with. Yeah. So now that I'm on the right, even though none of my beliefs have changed at all, what would be a good way to go about trying to get people to, to sit down and listen to understand that like, I'm still the same person I was last year, I just view things in a different way than you now? So I, I think that the first thing that you have to do is you have to determine whether the person that you're actually talking to is capable of hearing. Uh, you know, I don't think every conversation is equally valuable. Like sometimes you're talking with somebody and it's clear this person is not going to listen, this person doesn't care, this person wants to see me as bad because they have a, a stake, an emotional stake in seeing me as the bad guy. Don't bother, don't waste your time. Uh, then there's a group of people who have been told that it's okay to, it's okay morally to suggest that you're a bad person without evidence. And it's okay to say to this person, listen, you can't impute to me intents that are bad without any evidence of that, that makes you a bad person. But if I came in here and I just said, you're a bad person, I don't even know you, that makes me a jerk. Right? You don't get to do that. Uh, and I think that once people see that they're doing that, once you expose that that's what they're actually doing, a good person will say, you know what, I was doing that. Maybe now we can have a conversation about whether, where we disagree on policy. But you first have to get that out of the way because you're right. This is the number one argument the left makes is a character argument, right? You're a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe who hates people. You hate the poor and you want to kill them, right? Yeah, I've heard the, that one a lot the last year. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, this is the, it, it is the fundamental argument of the left. It's a character argument. And the right's not used to it because we're used to making Paul Ryan, you know, insurance adjuster arguments. Uh, and the first thing you have to do is you have to do away with the character arguments so you can actually get to making the, the substantive factual arguments. Okay. Thank you very Thanks much. A lot. Mr. Shapiro, uh, you've argued in the past that health care is not a right. However, from a natural law's perspective, rights are that